How would it feel if you were only one foot tall? How would you get anything done if you had to brush your teeth with a gigantic toothbrush? Your stairs were the size of an entire mountain range, and you couldn't find any clothing because you were the same size as a doll. All these questions should be pretty easy to answer. All I need to do is talk about an anime that I think is one of the best, so let's go ahead and talk about Spirit of Wonder from the 1990s. Spirit of Wonder is a relaxing and beautiful anime that takes place in the 1950s. It stars Miss China, the owner of a boarding house that doubles as a cafe for the local sailors. She inherited the place at a young age, and nobody really knows what her real name is, so everybody just calls her Miss China. The other central characters are tenants on the second floor. You've got the eccentric Dr. Breckenridge, a genius inventor creating machines that only he really understands. He's always on the edge of a scientific breakthrough, but try as he might, he can never seem to get any investors. Nobody believes him when he says that he can get to the moon. Every other day, China breaks down his door, and every time he has to come up with some crazy excuse as to why he can't pay his rent. Helping him with all of these scientific endeavors is Jim, a young watchmaker's apprentice. The road to innovation is paved with rare and expensive machinery, so it's up to him to track down all the stuff they need. Miss China has a bit of a crush on him, but she doesn't really know how to show it. She's kind of a stalker. So when she sees Jim talking to another girl in town, she gets pretty upset. The whole situation with the flower girl is just an anime misunderstanding. But to put Miss China's mind at ease, Jim presents her with a fancy ring in a box. She assumes it's a marriage proposal, but as it happens, it's made out of a stone that he got from the moon. Now even China would not believe something crazy like that, but Breckenridge wrote Happy Birthday Miss China on the lunar surface proving he's really the great inventor that he's always bragging about. Unfortunately, that ring breaks and she gets really depressed about it. This all gets explained in the final act, involving super science and a whole lot of romantic piano. The invention that they've been building towards and why it's called the China Ring are all revealed here, so I'll save you the trouble and say it's a pretty good ending. This is based on a series of manga called The Spirit of Wonder, and with that in mind, they were making this in hopes that you would buy that comic book down the line. You might call this a high-budget commercial. When Animego first released this thing, anime was not under the same scrutiny of the internet that it was today, so in that respect, I think they did a pretty good job. But when it came to the title, it just didn't really hold up. There's no way to say this, but the Japanese title was Miss China's Melancholy and nobody in America was going to buy something like that. They had to come up with a title with a little bit of a better ring to it. Anyway, it's all lighthearted fun despite its scientific backings. If you've never heard about this series, don't worry about it. There was a whole 10 year gap between 1992 and when we finally got a new episode. In that one, The Shrinking of Miss China, Breckenridge invents another telescope that changes the size of whatever it's focused on, and in the middle of testing the thing, Miss China, the heroine, she gets hit by a beam of light. And then the story follows her as she gets smaller and smaller and smaller, just kind of brushing her hair with a toothbrush, fighting off giant mice. I went and read the little booklet that came with the VHS tape because, yeah, that's a thing that they used to do, and it said that they were going for a sort of Alice in Wonderland tribute, and I can kind of see it. There's a rabbit at the beginning of it. I guess this is supposed to be the Cheshire Cat. And they even made reference to that one time that Alice grew to the size of an entire house. Each part of this series involves something getting bigger or something getting smaller, or in the case of the sequels, it presents you with an endearing romance for the night sky. The kind you might have had as a child and you need to be reminded of from time to time. Could you really walk on the moon? I mean, what would that be like, right? How about Mars? Two more shorts would tackle a few of those questions. The second is about Breckenridge's other invention that allows him to mold space and time however he wants. Logically, Miss China wants to see if she can get a better look at Mars's fabled Martian canals, so they point it up towards the heavens and they walk around a bit. There's a huge fight with a monster, some flashbacks to China's youth, and it's all over before you know it. It's only 10 minutes long. The final one is called The Sake Cup of Miss China, and it's a prequel where she just... I don't know what they were going for, I guess she's just drinking a bunch of sake on the beach. How she came to Bristol to start up her cafe and how she would meet her would-be tenants is all expanded on here. But nothing really happens, it's just some fan service for people who wanted to add another page to that anime bathtub scene wiki. In fact, you can't even find this thing on the American DVD. 
I guess somebody decided that this was uh, a little bit too hot for American sensibilities, so you're gonna have to import that Japanese version if you wanted to see this thing. With how fun this series is, you would think that there would be a bunch of episodes about Miss China and Breckenridge just doing crazy scientific stuff, but as far as anthologies go, this is barely an anime at all. There's one 42 minute VHS tape, there are three shorts that are all 10 minutes long, and that's it. Yeah, I hate to disappoint you, and I mean, yeah, I guess these are just commercials for a manga, I get that. But in the case of this series, it's a little bit weird. It's not the fault of the studios for not making more, it's more because the creator is known for being the slowest manga artist of all time. The Spirit of Wonder started in the 1980s, and it ended in 1994, and during this period, Miss China got a grand total of... 5 chapters. That's not volumes. Chapters. Man, imagine waiting an entire year for your favorite show to post something new. How embarrassing would that be? We got these comic books that they were advertising these series on back when they mirrored manga left to right so you could read it in the proper American direction. So anyway, that anime came out in the 90s and then it was radio silence until we got any more of it about a decade later. That shrinking of Miss China shorts, well that's just sort of a Looney Tunes thing that they slapped at the beginning of a movie. The final thing that this series ever got was a movie called Spirit of Wonder, The Scientific Boys Club. This one isn't about Miss China at all. It focuses on a group of old men like Breckenridge just trying to get into outer space. It opens on a slightly more modern setting too in the 1970s, where NASA is awaiting the first footage of Viking 1. They all laugh it up when somebody brings up a book discussing a now debunked hypothesis about how you could ride something called the ethereal current through outer space. Then we go back to Miss China's time and we actually get to meet the person who wrote it. Wendy is the author of this book and the daughter of one of the founders of the Scientific Boys Club. They're a bunch of lecherous old men, so they're constantly teasing her since they're probably related to Master Roshi or something. In their off time, they're just kicking it back, trying to figure out a way to get off this rock, but try as they might, they can't get a grasp on it. Wendy's husband, Jack, who's a non-character, is just sort of there, has to basically beg her for help. She's an accomplished writer and she's written an entire theory about how they can get into outer space, but in the face of her genius skills, she's much more interested in married life than getting into a zeppelin and trying to get to Mars. One of the central objects of the movie is Percival Lowell's real-life Mars globe, a model of the red planet that kickstarted the whole idea of Little Green Men. Percival Lowell theorized that the lines that he saw on Mars, way back in a telescope in the 1800s, were actually created by another race of human beings. He came to the conclusion that if there is life on Mars, it might just be as different as America is to Japan. You might say the whole reason anime even exists is because somebody went to Japan, spent a decade there, fell in love with it, and then it kind of blew their mind. As the story progresses, Wendy helps them with their math, they'll go back and forth between a couple of bars, and you even get a cameo from Miss China. I guess that means these both take place in the same town, so there's an expanded universe going on there. The sun goes up, the sun goes down, it's all relaxing in the typical healing fashion that a lot of my favorite series have. They also mastered the art of fire that goes out perfectly in real time. Have you ever tried to draw fire reflected in somebody's eye? It's hard. This anime was directed by Takashi Ano, who also did the first Yokohama Shopping Log anime episodes. You can tell it's him, because he really loves to turn streetlights on and off. I thought the backgrounds might have been traced over or something too, but no, the people who were making this were just that good! This is also going to be a horrible anime for a lot of you, because it's methodically slow in particular in its pacing, and it's the perfect thing to watch before you go to sleep. It's relaxing, it's one of those anime series. I'd like to show you clips from other series that Kenji Saruta, the person who did this manga, has done, but his next works don't even have anime for reasons that escape me. Five years later, he started work on Eminon. Eminon follows a long-haired girl with no name, so she goes by Eminon. That's no name backwards. She meets people who wander in and out of her life, and it's been described as an excuse to write a story about a cute girl bumming around 1970s Japan, which you can't go wrong with. Most of it explores the human condition, the impermanence of life, and other very laid-back musings. It's based on a story with the same title, but even though it's pulling from a 50-year-old book, the idea is pretty novel. Eminon has always existed, so she is literally timeless. 
Her memory goes back to when the planet first formed, and when she has a child, her memories get transferred onto her kid. How do you leave an impression on somebody who's been around that long anyway? Well, you can find out now, because after a decade of making it, he finally finished the thing. I've never read his other works, but according to the paperback, he started it in 2006 and finished in 2012, making his reputation as the slowest artist of all time probably warranted. He makes my upload schedule look like a weekly shonen jump. The sequel, Wandering Eminon, was published in 2008 and ended in 2017, meaning it only had 37 chapters in the span of 11 years. You know what's really incredible? There's still people out there who can't wait for the next one. Whether he's a genius recluse, has incredibly high standards, or maybe he's just low on money, it kind of hurt his reputation. He'll often go years and years and years without updates, and even though his manga all sell pretty well, he can't be bothered to put out any more content. This got so bad, the Eminon manga was cancelled. Or maybe it got ended early because no publisher could figure out how to sell the damn thing. You just can't be a cool guy who does things at your own pace, and then put out 10 out of 10 content. That's what they call non-financially viable. Kenji Saruta is one of my favorite artists, and there's times where I look at the things that he's done, and I say to myself, that had to have been a real-life place that existed at one point. The alternative is he memorized his entire plant species just to make his backgrounds look better, and if that's the case, then he's even more impressive than I give him credit. You know, it's easy to draw a really complicated page that just kind of seems good on a technical level, but it's way, way harder to make something simple stand out. Some of his paneling is second to none. This one window shot of Eminon and the implied movement of her arm is so masterful that it just seems effortless. Even when you remove that panel from the page, it still feels the same. I don't know how he did that. Every single thing that he draws feels like a moment stopped in time. I have a hunch that he also worked on the anime in some capacity with the director, because this exact same shot shows up in the Scientific Boys Club, so maybe that's just something that he had on his mind at the time. I don't know, I, I think this is genius and I can't really put it into words, so that's a failing on my part. There's a foreword at the end of his final Eminon manga that comes off as really, really apologetic. He's one of those slow, meticulous legends, the kind where people go, please, please, please just put something new out. Just do something. We don't care what it is, just do something. But every time they ask, he just takes longer and longer and longer, almost as if despite his huge fan base. Some of his other works include the manga for the anime Abinobashi, as well as the characters from that series. Whether he's actually a real part of Studio Gainax or not, I couldn't tell you. In the 90s, he would routinely run away from his editors to go hang out at their offices, so from the outside, it seems like he just kind of broke in one day and never left. During his sleepovers, he also worked with them on a number of smaller projects, none of them very well documented. Before Evangelion exploded in popularity, Gainax was doing a bunch of small PC games to stay afloat, and it was during this period that he worked on a bunch of wallpaper called Alice in the Wonderwall. That's not even manga, that's just fancy wallpaper, that's how little this guy makes. It was intended as a sort of digital art book, back when computer generated graphics were brand new and exciting. It's all meant to captivate the imagination so you're not looking at a bunch of flying toasters all day. This is also why Miss China wears some doll clothing in The Shrinking of Miss China. Those madmen stuck in a reference to a screensaver! I also can't get over this picture of a fox that they slapped some English text onto. It's embossed with a single word. Windows! You know, just to remind you, it was really made on a computer. That, that used to... that used to mean something. It really, really did. According to the site that I found, there's a Macintosh version too that says the same thing, so it's not like a dig at Microsoft. That's just how they did things back then. These art books were released on floppy disk and are quite rare, so you might consider them lost media if your definition of that term is thing that has not been put on the internet yet. The creator of Evangelion also really likes to poke fun at this guy. Here's a few things he had to say about his body of work. Work faster. Work! Let's release another volume this century! I hope to read the next Tonko Bon while I'm still alive. 
In 2020, Anno starred in a movie where he was cast as a manga artist, and even though it was the role he was born to play, all the artwork was presented by Kenji Suruta, so I guess they're still on pretty good terms. There's other deepest lore about the King of Slow Work that's expanded on in a CD called Made in China, everything you wanted to know about Kenji Suruta. That would have been a great thing to have when I was making this video, but unfortunately that's not online anywhere I've looked, and I guess you can probably tell what's on it. The man just does not feel like working, making him a bona fide hero. I get the feeling that he also has a very specific taste in women. Miss China, Wendy, Eminon, they all have a similar vibe to him. You see this sometimes in the world of art. Men driven to perfection by their ideal image of beauty. He'll release about one chapter a year, and routinely starts up series that he never finishes. As far as I know, his main job is illustrator, so he just does manga whenever he feels like it. In other words, he's an artist. Going back through time, we can peer into Gainax's website, which has a write-up on him from 1998. Even decades later, remarkably little has changed. Kenji Suruta goes by many names, including artists of amazingly small quantity, and he who brings tears to the eyes of more editors than anyone else in Japan. Because of his dislike of work, he's had very few creations, but the sense of transparency which his art has, combined with the unique science fiction sensibility which informs the worlds that he creates, has earned him many fans over the years. His hit series, The Spirit of Wonder, is doing quite well at the time of this writing, but the quantity of his output has steadily begun to decline. His serial in Afternoon Magazine, The Spirit of Wonder, The China Stories, only has five chapters since it came out in 1989. Back to my own opinions here, this series, it's solid gold, I have not found a single thing that this man has made that I have not enjoyed. If you skipped to the end of the video so you didn't have to watch this thing that I made, well I guess you're smarter than me, so I go ahead and recommend Miss China's Ring, it's relaxing, goofy fun, all the shorts are pretty good too, especially the one with the shrinking girl in it, and if you want something a little longer, a little bit more philosophical, a little you know, a little slower, a little bit of a different mood. I recommend the Scientific Boys Club. It's not half bad. It fills you with a spirit of wonder. Thank you very much for watching this video. Oh, she no hana.